In each genre, a few titles always reign supreme, at least in regards to public attention. For platformers, your mind may go to Mario. For shooters, the public often thinks of Call of Duty or Battlefield. In the world of RPGs, the king of the hill has long been Final Fantasy. While we may often imagine Final Fantasy VII as being one of the first big Final Fantasy titles, that's really only true for the West. Final Fantasy VI actually sold nearly as many copies in Japan as its next generation successor sold in the United States. Had more frequent releases of Final Fantasy, as well as its main competitor Dragon Quest, been made available to American audiences in the early 90s, then these franchises may have had a much larger and earlier explosion of popularity than we actually witnessed. Released in April of 1994, Final Fantasy VI was developed by Square for the Super Nintendo. Upon reaching the United States a few months later, this entry was localized as Final Fantasy III, due to the original Final Fantasy II, III, and V remaining unreleased in the US and exclusive to Japanese audiences. However, retrospective conversation has resorted to referring to each American release by their official numerical titles, so we'll be referring to this entry as number 6, rather than 3, for the length of this video. Final Fantasy VI was the first entry in the franchise to be directed by someone other than series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi. For this project, the role was instead split between two up-and-coming designers at Square, Yoshinori Kitaze and Hiroyuki Ito, the latter of whom even designed Final Fantasy's unique active time battle system. Despite being almost 30 years old at this point, Final Fantasy VI is still commonly voted among series fans as one of the overall top 5 if not top 3 favorite games in the franchise. It was also the best selling game in Japan in 1994 and one of the worldwide best selling games on the Super Nintendo overall. Multiple re-releases and ports of Final Fantasy VI to the PlayStation and Game Boy Advance also individually managed to sell hundreds of thousands more copies. Let's figure out how this title had such a historic impact on gaming and the world of RPGs as we discuss what's so great about Final Fantasy VI. Though the Final Fantasy series has always dabbled in the realm of science fantasy, the setting of this sixth entry resembles the Second Industrial Revolution, with electrification, transportation, and rapid industrialization all being key components in both the game's story and gameplay. This non-specific time period, which included a blend of technology and magic, would go on to be a common theme and setting in future Final Fantasy titles. As for this entry's plot, players find themselves on a planet known only as the World of Balance in the aftermath of a conflict referred to as the War of the Magi, which nearly destroyed the entire planet but ended with the separation of the natural and magical realms. The events of this conflict have all but faded into myth at this point, however, 1,000 years later, faint traces of magic have begun to reappear, including in characters like Terra, the first protagonist that players are introduced to, whose half-human, half-esper upbringing is seen as something to be feared. But we'll get more into what espers are, how magic works in this game, and all of that in a bit. This synopsis may seem overwhelming, as the introduction to any new fantasy world often is, but the pacing of the game actually managed to make this odyssey not only manageable, but enjoyable, in a time when epic storytelling in video games was just beginning to bloom, with a greater understanding of gameplay as a vehicle for an emotional journey. According to the developers at Square, Final Fantasy VI's experience was based on the idea that every character is the protagonist. Co-director Yoshinori Kitaze explained that all 14 of the game's playable characters were developed through contributions from the entire development team. After the unique characters were created, Kitaze then connected all of their stories into one cohesive experience. Throughout the game, players will have the opportunity to meet and recruit several characters with their own unique gameplay mechanics and fleshed out stories. Every character has a brief introduction, usually including a bit of dialogue establishing something about their personality and a description of their status in the world. With all of the wildly different experiences and upbringings these characters have had, it's interesting to see how they all mix together as these relationships grow through both argument and collaboration. The pace and method of every character's growth is also very unique to the Final Fantasy experience. There are some great discrepancies in how well you really understand each character's motivations, whether it's obvious from the start, or there are intentional questions left to be answered further down the road. The game is full of side quests, especially in the second half, that further develop each character's backstory, 
These aren't always difficult, with modestly leveled enemies and occasional boosts like special equipment or extra party members, but they still keep things interesting by switching up the way the game is experienced. Suddenly you have to approach an issue differently due to which characters are accessible or which clues you've gathered towards the next step in your current endeavor. Completing side quests specific to a main character will often grant rewards to that character, such as unique equipable items or other boosts to their specific abilities. As someone who gets lost or overwhelmed when side quests are introduced in RPGs, the ones in Final Fantasy VI fall in line so well that they feel like the next rational step of the game for you to experience, whether it's mandatory or not. The way certain events will trigger based on who's in your party, even without telling you, makes every cutscene or sudden sharp turn on your path feel like it occurred naturally. Before you gain access to the wide open world, your adventure will split into three miniature plot lines, during which the game will demonstrate what it's like to work with all kinds of different parties and character types, such as having your magic users isolated from all of the heavy hitters, and another character left on his own who has to utilize cunning over combat to sneak around enemy lines. Combat is kept fun and engaging due to the wildly varied fighting styles of every character under your control. This isn't even like Pokemon's system of just thinking which type is better or focusing on status effects, or Fire Emblem's rock, paper, scissors, weapon triangle. In Final Fantasy VI, each character has different means of attacking single characters, whole groups at a time, how they deal damage versus how they protect themselves or others, where magic comes into play, even how they learn different moves or how they need to be input by the player. For example, Sabin's Blitz maneuver needs to be memorized by the player and then input like a special move in Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. Staying faithful to Sabin's martial artist backstory and making his gameplay feel unlike anything else that had been seen in an RPG. The wild boy Gao, who survived his youth in the wilderness by adapting to the world around him, can learn the attacks of enemies and mimic their behavior in future battles. None of the characters operate in too similar a manner, and it means every player will have their favorites. At the same time, battles actually require more strategy and involvement than just hitting the A button until all of the enemies are dead. All of these different combat types were much easier to learn thanks to the way the game split up the cast into much more manageable groups, so you had to spend some time using all of the individual powers. On top of what each character is capable of on their own, there also exists a mechanic in many Final Fantasy games to boost and modify your party's capabilities in order to suit your individual playstyle. In Final Fantasy VI, that mechanic would be espers, the beings involved in the War of the Magi a thousand years before this game's events. Espers are magical creatures of godlike strength that, after being fought, become an equipable magic spirit called Magicite. And by equipping and utilizing these spirits for long enough, each explorer in the player's party has the potential to learn that particular Esper's abilities. Each Esper has a specific set of skills to offer, such as Starlet's healing abilities or Palador's speed-based effects. They're basically the Final Fantasy version of Greek gods, and have remained staples of the franchise's magical metaverse since the Japanese-only Final Fantasy III. With the ability to hand these espers around like trading cards between your characters, each member of your party is able to be molded into whatever kind of fighter you want, and can also cover your bases in case of emergency by broadening every character's list of strengths. This is a great advantage to late game players or those who invest time in their character's growth, because Final Fantasy VI is fraught with some of the most enjoyably complicated fights to ever appear within the confines of turn-based combat. Final Fantasy VI uses an active time battle system, as in the time is always running and there aren't explicit turns in which you decide your next move. You have to be focused on the conditions of your characters and whose turn is next. You can see the timer next to each of your characters' names that counts up until they're rested enough to take another turn. This system was actually created and implemented by Final Fantasy VI's co-director, Hiroyuki Ito, back in Final Fantasy IV, but the refinement of this system, as well as how the player acclimates to it, had progressed so much between the development of the fourth and sixth titles. Players are warned about the existence of resistances very early in the game, but the magic and damage systems in Final Fantasy go far beyond a simple type advantage. While some enemies may be entirely resilient to a certain magic type, others will trigger these specific buffs at various points of their battle. Since it takes a moment for your character to follow through on their order, some enemies will react in different ways between turns due to the active battle system. This is exemplified early on in your fight with the Welk, which will hide in its lightning rod style shell and reflect damage back at the player. You're warned by a bit of dialogue that it's about to hide away, so the player has a chance to cease all of their character's commands until the mini-boss reveals itself again. 
As the game goes on, players have to learn about more and more complicated enemies on the fly in order to strategize their way through difficult fights. Enemies also run out of mana at some point, so if nothing else, you can try and wait out a difficult fight by doing nothing but healing and defending until your foe becomes much less powerful. This may seem like a basic aspect of high-quality pixel-based graphics, but a massive feature in Final Fantasy VI is the use of shading and gradients in its artwork. Developers were really figuring out how to step away from the limited color palettes that home video game consoles had been confined to without the additional hardware power of a high-end arcade machine. The use of shading specifically makes a huge difference when comparing Final Fantasy VI with its competitors at the time. This art style that didn't restrain itself to the cubism origins of video game displays broke expectations on how far pixel-based artwork and games could still grow. This is such a timeless visual design that even with the intense hardware limitations, these Super Nintendo graphics have aged far better than the Western computer RPGs of the time, such as Ultima 7 or Might and Magic 5. The game's opening credit sequence alone is mind-blowing by Super Nintendo standards. Obviously, there are incredibly well-designed games of all shapes and sizes, but the theatrics in Final Fantasy VI's cinematic opening are a tremendously impressive use of the Super Nintendo's capabilities. Whenever you transition to the overworld between towns, the game graphically shifts to what is known as Mode 7, basically tilting the image on which your character is standing to provide more of a rolling planet feeling and add a sense of depth to the player's perspective of the world. The overworld, as well as the backgrounds of fights, are much more lively than in any previous RPG, with hot desert air shifting behind you or waves crashing in the ocean. In fact, some of these backgrounds look so ridiculously good for 1994 that I'm not entirely sure if they're digitized photos or original artwork. Either way, the combination of interesting environments and uniquely designed enemies raises Final Fantasy VI's combat experience well above its competitors and predecessors. In the years leading up to Final Fantasy VI's release, role-playing games hadn't changed all that much, though it's not as if they necessarily needed to. Dragon Quest and Fantasy Star were still unleashing some of their own great hits in the RPG genre, but aside from unique quality of life adjustments to cater towards their own formula, many of these games and franchises played in a remarkably similar fashion. However, after years of little more than combat tweaks and new interfaces, Square managed to send role-playing into the next generation of gaming's evolution. In a gameplay sense, experiences like those found in Final Fantasy VI are still trying to be recreated to this day, with Square Enix's modern titles like Octopath Traveler and Triangle Strategy taking their own stab at the multi-character formula. And aesthetically speaking, this clean, detailed sprite design is still used as inspiration to this day, even outside of the RPG genre as can be seen in games like Terraria and Stardew Valley. Another incredible feature of Final Fantasy VI that aided in bridging the interest gap between Eastern and Western audiences was the way characters were treated in this adventure. The multiple units that you may spend your time with, either regularly or rarely, have very unique stories and styles of gameplay. The fact that every character in Final Fantasy VI has the potential to be your most beneficial member or learn virtually any spell with the use of espers means that every character may have an intended purpose and certainly an area of expertise that makes things easier for the player, but can still be molded differently in every unique playthrough to fit the tastes of the individual player. That is what's so great about Final Fantasy VI. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming as we explored the revolutionary world of Final Fantasy VI. Want to see some bonus content? Maybe support the creation of these videos? If so, check out the What's So Great Discord, Twitch, or Patreon. Links for all of those are in the description. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, Banjo-Kazooie, on screen or in the description. And please take the time to subscribe to be involved in the discussions here. Thanks again for watching. Now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.